Cuenta Silmarillion, The History of the Silmarils. Chapter 1 of the Beginning of Days. So, remember when Melkor was fiddling around with Arda and ruining all of the Valar's work? Well, in order to put a stop to all his nonsense, the Valar have the first war with him. And Tulkas is still with Iluvatar at this time, but when he sees all the destruction happen, he becomes the last Vala to go down into the world and fight Melkor, who then runs away and hides in the outer darkness. And then after that, the Valar finally finish making Arda, and they set up two giant lamps to light the earth continuously. One in the north, Iluin, and one in the south, Ormal. And the Valar choose to live on an island called Almaren in the middle of a lake in the center of Middle Earth, which is surrounded by the encircling seas. So everything is nice and symmetrical, and the Valar are content and happy, and this period of time is called the Spring of Arda. And remember, Arda is a globe. Actually, on page 17 it says, And they saw a new world made visible before them, and it was globed amid the void. But the actual earth part within that globe is flat. I know that that sounds kind of wacky. That's because it is. <laughs> but keep in mind that Tolkien developed this mythology over decades, so he was constantly retooling and reworking his uh, ideas about how the Earth was formed and what it looked like in the early days. So yeah, it's like flat, but within a globe. So now that they've finished creating the world, the Valar have a great feast to celebrate, and Tulkas and Nessa get married, and everyone rests and relaxes. But while they're feasting and relaxing, Melkor gathers his minions, and he and they sneak back into Arda over the walls of night. And then he begins construction on his own vast underground fortress in the far north. And this stronghold is called Utumno and it starts to pollute the land and living things around it. The spring of Arda, it's starting to get marred. The Valar now suspect that he has returned, but before they can do anything about it, he strikes first. He knocks over and breaks the two lamps, which causes fires and earthquakes and tsunamis. Oh my gosh, it's just, it's terrible. And the shape of Arda, and the symmetry of its waters and its lands was marred in that time, so that the first designs of the Valar were never after restored. So this is the end of the Spring of Arda. Melkor escapes back to Utumno before the Valar can figure out where he is, and they try to subdue the raging oceans, settle things down a bit, because they still don't know exactly when the children of Iluvatar are supposed to come. He doesn't, the Valar don't know when elves and then men are supposed to awake, so they need to make sure that the earth is inhabitable and ready for them. And in the midst of all of this tumult, new continents are formed, namely Middle Earth and Aman. So here we have a map of Arda after it's been marred a little bit. So we've got the continent of Aman, which is in the west, and like I said before, it is the one that has the region of Valinor. So this is where the Valar go to live. And Aman is often called the Blessed Realm or the Undying Lands. So if you ever see those terms, you know that it's referring to this continent. And Middle-earth is the continent in the east. That's where all the stuff in The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings takes place and where a lot of the story in the Silmarillion takes place, too. Now, there are a few new words here, some new geography words, so let's look at them. Some of the most important to know are Belagair, that's the Great Sea. It's the sea that separates Aman and Middle-earth. And the mountains, called Pelori, they are the tallest mountains in all of Arda, and they are all along the east coast of Aman. And the tallest of the tallest mountains in the whole world, it's called Taniquetil. And it's on this mountain where Manwe and Varda live. Manwe can look far out, even into the farthest east, when he's on top of Taniquetil. So now behind the walls of the Pelori Mountains, the Valar set up their kingdom of Valinor. 
and they need to set the mountains really high because they're so tired uh, from fixing the earth after Melkor was mucking about in it and they feel they should really build their own stronghold to protect against them. So they have time to gather beautiful things, to make cities and gardens, and Valinor winds up looking even more beautiful than Middle-earth did in the Spring of Arda. And nothing dies there because it's holy. That's why it's called the Undying Lands. Yeah, so they set up those mountains just to be an easy stronghold for them. Then they build their capital city, Valmar. I know it's lots of V words, right? Tolkien really liked alliteration. <laughs> and right outside of the western gates of the city of Valmar, they have a council area called the Ring of Doom, where they come together to plan or make very serious judgments. And to the west of the Ring of Doom is a grass-covered mound called Zellohar. And on this mound is where Yavanna sings a song of great power and all things that grow, and Nienna waters it with her tears. And meanwhile, all the other Valar sit in the Ring of Doom and listen. Then two trees sprout from the mound. The first is called Telperion, and it shines silver light. And the second tree is called Laurelin, and it shines a golden light. These are the two trees of Valinor. One will always shine while the other is dim, and then the other will shine while the other goes dim, and back and forth, and back and forth. So there is no sun and moon yet. The only light lighting any part of the earth, besides stars, is these two trees. And Varda collects their shiny dew in a bunch of vats that surround the trees. And so even if you forget everything from this chapter, remember these two trees. They are very, very important. So now this, with the growing of the two trees, marks the bliss of Valinor. So these trees now light all of Valinor, because remember, after Melkor broke the lamps, the world is dark, but their light doesn't go out far enough across the sea to light Middle-earth. The Pelori Mountains are actually blocking their light. So Middle-earth is still under a twilight of stars. And Melkor has the run of that place. It's his domain right now. Remember before when I talked about Orome, like he liked going there to battle monsters and hunt Melkor's monsters? That's what I'm talking about. It's just riddled with nasty creatures at this point. So most of the Valar do not go to Middle-earth, and they seem to have forgotten about it. But Manwe still keeps tabs on what's going on, and Ulmo cares very much for the whole world. Remember, he lives everywhere, not in Valinor. And Yavanna goes to Middle-earth sometimes to try to fix some of Melkor's mess, because you bet he likes chopping down trees and destroying plants, right? And, of course, I said Orome hunts monsters. And in this section of the chapter, it mentions different groups of elves and which Valar they learn from. The chapter after next gives a lot more context about the elves, so for now, don't worry if you forget these descriptions and the names of the elf groups, because I will definitely return to them in much greater detail later on. As you've probably gathered already, the Silmarillion kind of likes to jump around a little bit. So don't worry, I will cover everything. The chapter ends talking about elves and men, the children of Iluvatar. And it says that the Valar cannot force either elves or men to do things against their will. So free will is a big, uh, it's a big concept in there. And uh, Iluvatar speaks. Behold, I love the earth, which shall be a mansion for the Quendi, elves, and the Atani, men. But the Quendi shall be the fairest of all earthly creatures, and they shall have and shall conceive and bring forth more beauty than all my children, and they shall have the greater bliss in this world. But to the Atani, I will give a new gift. Therefore he willed that the hearts of men should seek beyond the world, and should find no rest therein, but they should have a virtue to shape their life amid the powers and chances of the world, beyond the music of the Ainur, which is as fate to all things else." So in other words, men have men will have more control over their own fate and shaping their own future beyond what the music of the Ainur originally entailed. And it's because of this gift of freedom that men have short lives. So when they die, their souls go beyond the confines of the world. So once they die, they're gone. 
Elves, on the other hand, are immortal and forever bound to the world. They can die from grief or be slain, but their souls go to the halls of Mandos, and after a while they are eventually reincarnated back into their original bodies. So elves also love the world and enjoy it a lot more than men do because <laughs> they're stuck here forever, at least until the world is destroyed. So regarding men dying, death is their fate, the gift of Iluvatar which as time wears, even the powers shall envy. I think that's a really interesting quote. So becoming severed or freed from the confines of the earth is actually a gift, a mercy even, because as the long eons go by, even the Valar will become weary of existence. But you know, of course, of course, Melkor will find a way to make the gift not seem like a gift, but rather a curse. And we'll see throughout the book how this theme comes into play again and again. Men not liking their fate or being resentful against it. So finally, the Valar tell the elves that men will have a part in the second music of the Ainur. But Iluvatar doesn't say what he has planned for the elves after the end of the world. This is a very cryptic ending to the chapter. So the world will end eventually, and there will be a second music and a second making, but we, we really don't know exactly what's going to happen. 